everybody, welcome back to my channel where we like to get real nerdy about sex. So today I want to talk about sex and death and how they're maybe a bit similar, some are rituals we have around them and whether or not death is erotic. This is a video that has been playing on my mind for a really long time and you may or may not know but I studied history at university and took a lot of modules and did my dissertation on sexual history and I remember one of my tutors saying that some philosophers had said that the only times that human beings are ever truly free in life is in sex and in death and that has just stuck with me all of these years. And so here we are, I'm finally diving into this topic for a video. Some people say that sex makes them feel so alive. And is it its proximity to death that makes us feel this rush sometimes? Mm. <laughs> so in this video, I am drawing together a bunch of research from books to podcast episodes to YouTube videos and going to be sharing it with you because I find this really interesting and maybe you will too. And shout out to Alyssa Eveland for help with the research for this video and Quinn Rhodes for helping with the writing of this video. You can check out all of their brilliant work in the links in the description. So do sex and death actually have anything in common? Let's try to find out starting with la petite mort. You may have heard this phrase before, it's in a lot of pop culture. It is French literally meaning the little death and we use it to refer to orgasms. And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the little death has been a common English phrase for orgasm since the 16th century. English speaking people like myself like to say, did you know that the French call an orgasm a little death? But is this actually the case? Death and orgasm. We don't actually know if the phrase la petite mort was used in French before the 19th century. It's possible that the Victorians translated a common English euphemism into French in order to distance themselves from talking about sex directly and then French authors adopting this phrase and its meaning. Or it's possible that French authors adopted the English slang for a little death in their own literary works and then the English just decided to keep it in French in order to sound a bit fancy. And so, lo and behold, la petite mort is not common slang for an orgasm in French. Someone who speaks French wouldn't use it in the same way that the English use coming, for example. And I'm really curious to hear what slang you have in your languages that you speak for orgasm in the comments. Please do let me know, I'm very curious. I definitely originally thought that it was a French phrase that was absorbed into English, but it is very likely that it was probably the other way around. La petite mort doesn't appear in the official French dictionary until 1863, even though associations between sex and death had been around long before the 19th century. But since the 19th century, French writers and intellectuals have often used la petite mort in a kind of tongue-in-cheek way to describe that moment after orgasm when it seems that the spirit has left the body. It's this physical response of some kind of post-orgasmic oblivion that is key to the idea of la petite mort. And this is especially a thing for people with penises who are less likely to have multiple orgasms and may need to recover after each orgasm. And of course, orgasms can make people of all genders feel a little sleepy afterwards. Guilty of that. Definitely like to have a sleep after an orgasm. And when writers and intellectuals were making these comparisons, they were building on contemporary medical beliefs about the body. In the 14th and 15th centuries, Europeans believed that the body was comprised of four competing substances, blood, phlegm, yellow bile and black bile. The balance of these fluids was important and it was thought that you shouldn't waste them unless it was on doctors orders and sickness and death were caused by an imbalance of these fluids. It was believed that the loss of semen weakened a man and so must be used sparingly and for reproductive purposes only, which we now know is obviously 
Not true. Just keep jizzing. <laughs> Just keep jizzing. And speaking of wasting or spending semen and orgasms causing death, let's talk about Shakespearean slang. From William Shakespeare's work, we know that the euphemism to die, meaning to spend oneself in orgasm, was everywhere in 14th and 15th century English literature. Audiences coming to see Shakespeare plays wanted to be entertained, and so he deliberately played with the euphemism of dying as an orgasm for laughs. And you can find lots of other sex euphemisms in Shakespeare. For example, sheath means a vagina, so those plays were a lot dirtier than our secondary school teachers led us to believe. And now onto the logical successor of Shakespeare, Mean Girls. Specifically, I want to talk about the very famous abstinence-only sex ed class where Coach Carr says, don't have sex because you will get pregnant and die. And also, if you touch each other, you will get chlamydia and die. Obviously, abstinence-only sex education is a very sex-negative model of sex education, shaming people for having sex and teaching that the only way to avoid unintended pregnancies or STIs is to not have sex at all. Which, obviously, it isn't. The scene is supposed to be a caricature and an exaggeration of abstinence-only sex education, but this is genuinely the extent of sex education that some people receive. Here, sex equals death, and death is presented as the only conclusion and the obvious consequence of daring to have sex. In abstinence-only sex education, you can have sex, but only if you're married, which leads us to marriage and funeral rites. So let's talk about sex and death in relation to the rituals we have around them. So funerals for death and um, marriage for sex. Firstly, there's the traditional till death do us part in marriage ceremonies, which can be traced back to something called sarum use. This was developed in Salisbury, England in roughly the 13th century, which is where the first modern wedding vows come from. I spoke to Dr. Eleanor Yarniger about this, and she said that this is now a standard part of wedding vows in the Western world, and is directly connected to the church's attempt to make marriage into a strictly religious thing, as opposed to a civil thing. Before the high medieval period where the church got more power, marriage was more of a civil than a religious arrangement. The phrase emphasises that marriage is a religious sacrament that cannot be undone. Death is the only way out. And of course, the Catholic Church still doesn't fully recognise divorce, although you won't be excommunicated for it anymore. In mine and Dan's wedding, which was a non-religious ceremony at our local registry office, the phrase, till death do us part, was not present and was replaced with something along the lines of for the rest of our married life together, which felt to me a lot more accurate and appropriate for us and for the 21st century. So moving on to some funeral and marriage rituals from some different parts of the world. Rural Greece. Let's talk about the funeral rituals of a small rural town on the Greek side of Cyprus called Potamia. Their funeral rituals cover a year or more and involve the initial funeral, burying the body and letting it decompose into a skeleton, digging up the skeleton and holding a second type of funeral, and then placing the skeleton in a final resting place. Here, the comparison between marriage and death is really played up when an unmarried person passes away. Their funeral is celebrated as if it is their wedding and they are marrying the earth or grave. Unmarried people are traditionally buried in wedding attire including wedding crowns, which are sometimes placed on their heads by their godparents, as would be done in a Greek Orthodox wedding. Unmarried women are also buried with pieces of their dowry, and widows will traditionally attend the funeral of their husband dressed as a bride rather than dressed in black. It's suggested that these traditions are done as a way to make death a part of life, denying its finality and the otherness of death, although assuming that death has some kind of inherent otherness in the first place is quite a white and western point of view. Ghost marriage is a tradition still practiced in some parts of China where one or both parties are deceased. Living relatives of the dead treat the dead as if they are still alive. They are in a state that is both alive and dead. There are a few reasons why this tradition exists and some of them may seem quite sexist. It's seen as a man's right to claim a wife and so ghost marriages can 
give a man something that he is seen as having a right to if there aren't enough alive women to go around. In fact, the same dead woman can be exhumed, sold, married and reburied more than once as there are more men than women in China. In Chinese culture, it's also customary for children to be married in the order that they were born and so a dead son may be married so a younger living brother is able to do so. For women, dying before they were married meant that they couldn't be enshrined as an ancestor and given offerings to appease their spirits. Women don't have the right to be enshrined on their natal family's altar, only on their husbands, and so ghost marriages allow them to be remembered and honoured in this way. It's also interesting to note that men who married ghost brides could always remarry, but women who married ghost husbands could not. So we've talked about death and orgasm, marriage and funerals, and now is death erotic? Erotic means relating to sexual desire and pleasure. What we consider erotic varies from person to person and can actually be quite expansive. And for me, sometimes it just comes down to vibes. Obviously there is nothing sexy about death and I don't want to glorify death in any way, especially as so many people have died from COVID-19 in the last two years. However, there are centuries of philosophy and thinking about how sex and death are linked and how death is a taboo and potentially semi-erotic experience. Transcendent. The Greek philosopher Plato believed that we lived in two realms, the real and physical world, and a world of higher intellectual ideas and thinking. In his view, in order to lead a meaningful life, you had to reject the physical world and its processes like sex and birth to focus on the more superior realm of thinking and philosophy. Obviously we now know that sex can be a very important part of living a meaningful life for some people and may not be for others. And for some it might be a really spiritual experience and for others it might just be a bit of good sexy fun. Death and sin is when we get to Christian theology and the philosopher Augustine that people started to link sex and death because sex was associated with sin and the consequence of sin was death. It's really interesting that despite very much viewing sex as a sin, Augustine saw it as a sin of the mind rather than a sin of the body. According to him, you had sex because you had a weak mind and the physical state of your body had nothing to do with how virtuous you were. I see a lot of parallels here with the sex negative attitudes in modern society, which are often based on judging people who have a lot of sex or are perceived to have a lot of sex as having no self-control or no self-respect, which are of course more often aimed at women. Eroticism is certainly tied to this idea of taboo and the two biggest taboos in our society are arguably sex and death. The idea is that by thinking of sex as shameful, but doing it anyway, humans think of sex as deeply erotic. People like Georges Bataille thought that in order to find sex so hot, you had to be aware that you were breaking a taboo. The sexiness is in acknowledging the taboo and still fucking. And why does this link to death? Well, Bataille proposes that taboos exist in order to eliminate violence. And violence here is being used in a slightly different context than it is in our normal conversation. In this definition, social disruption is a form of violence. So taboos exist to avoid social disruption and complete chaos. Violence means breaking or changing your normal reality by say, dying or by having an orgasm. The origin of taboo around death was due to death being a sign of violence and chaos brought into the world. And part of the taboo around human sexuality comes from this fear of death. Sex reminds us of birth and birth reminds us of death. And so sex reminds us of our own mortality. Death is not sexy, but according to some, it is erotic because it involves the same breaking of taboos as sex does. So there you have it, a whole bunch of reasons and examples of how sex and death are linked and how both can be viewed as an erotic experience. What do you think? Could death be an erotic experience? Do you feel like you're going to die when you have an orgasm? Is sex a spiritual experience for you? I would love to hear all of your thoughts in the comments. I find all of this so interesting and I love that it is part of my job that I get to 
think about these things and explore these ideas and share them in these videos for you. And thank you so much to my patrons for supporting these videos. And there is a link in the description to my Patreon as well if you want to join our fabulous community of sex nerds. I hope that you're doing well and I'll see you in my next video. Bye.